I am Shai Halevi and I will talk about Random Index Private Information Retrieval and Application. This is joint work with Craig Gentry, Bernardo Magri, Jesper Nielsen and Sofia Yakubov. Let's jump in, remind ourselves what Private Information Retrieval is here. Here we have a client that wants to fetch an entry from some public database, but the server that's holding the database shouldn't learn what entry the client is interested in. So, of course, one way to do that is for the client to just download the entire database, and the whole point of Peer is to do better than this trivial solution, meaning to have the server send less to the client than the entire database. This was introduced by Shor Golrach, Kushilevitz, and Sudan in the 90s, and the first solutions that they gave relied on multiple non-colluding servers, but later on, uh, Kushlevitz and Ostrovsky show that you can do that also when there is a single server and there has been a very large body of research on peer and it's useful for many different things. In this work, we look at a peer with a twist. And that twist is the client is not interested in any one particular index. It just wants to get one index, a random index from the database. And the point is without the server knowing which one it got. So you should think of a lottery, for example, where people sign up with the server and give their personal details. Then the client chooses a random person to get the jackpot. But the server should know who was chosen before we announce the winner, because then the server can, I don't know, uh, extort them or do some other nasty thing. We call this uh, primitive a random index peer or an R peer for short. Why looking at it? So one thing that should be obvious is that RPeer is a weaker primitive than peer because um, if you could uh, do peer, then you can definitely do RPeer just by the client choosing a random index and then you run your peer protocol. And we can hope, therefore, that RPeer is easier to build than uh, peer. For example, maybe you can make it more efficient, maybe you can use weaker assumptions, Maybe you can run it in more settings where peer is impossible, etc. So that's on one hand. On the other hand, our peer is sufficient for some applications. So I already gave you the example of the lottery from before. Uh, the thing that motivated us to look at it is an application to the secrets and block on the blockchain architecture of Benhamuda et al. from uh, TCC of last year. Uh, and I will spend the end of this talk uh, talking about that application. And also during this course of this work, we find a, a nice little uh, application of it to peer with pre-processing, and I'll spend one slide talking about that as well later on. This work has two mostly orthogonal threads of work. One of them is just looking at our peer as a primitive, so defining it, looking at variations, how it relates to peer, how to construct it, and then the application that I uh, talked about of to peer with pre-processing. And the second line of work is the application to the secrets of blockchain. That was our motivation for this work with some optimization specific in the context of that application. So let's start from the RPR as a primitive. Uh, and we'll begin with trying to define it. Now, in this work, we only looked at the semi-honest case. So the server is honest, but wants to learn the, the index of the uh, client. And this particular definition is for the single server protocol, so it's a two-party protocol. There is a client with no uh, input and there is a server that has the database, which is modeled just as an MB string. The server will have no output. The client output is an index and the corresponding database bit. If both of them are honest, then the index that the client gets is uniform or close to it. In terms of what we need, well, we need correctness. That is, the bit that the uh, client learns is indeed the bit of the database. We need non-triviality, which means that the server sends less than n bits. And we need privacy for the client, which means that uh, even with the server's view, the index that the client got is indistinguishable from another index that was chosen uniformly at random in irrespective of the protocol. Some variations that uh, would be useful, one of them is just batch. Instead of a single index, you want multiple one. The definition is identical, except instead of a single index, there is a vector of indexes that the client gets. And then in the context of batch RP, you can even look at weaker security. 
So instead of the indexes, the vector of indexes that the client gets being indistinguishable from uniform, it's indistinguishable from some other distribution D, which is random enough. What random enough is might depend on your application, but uh, reasonable general purpose definition of what it means to be random enough is that for every subset of vectors of n to the k, if that subset has a negligible probability mass according to the uniform distribution, then it also has a negligible probability mass according to the distribution d that we want here. And that definition says that any bad event that happens with negligible probability uh, in the strong sense, if you had random uh, indexes, will also happen with negligible probability in this protocol. So that's a useful definition to have. As I said here, we only treat honest but curious. It actually is an open problem even to just define what RP means in the malicious setting. It's not trivial and we did not try to do it. The first result that I want to tell you about is a theorem that says that RP as a primitive is equivalent to PL up to a small increase in the communication and the round. On one hand, that means that you cannot hope for too much in terms of RP being easier to build than peer because they're equivalent. But we will still show that there are gains that have, uh, can be made and it's still interesting enough to look at. But let's for now prove that R peer as a primitive is equivalent to peer. One direction is trivial. One direction we already show. If you had peer, you can definitely implement R peer trivially. So let's try the other direction. Let's say that you have an implementation of a non-trivial R peer and let's try to build out of it an implementation of peer. So I'm going to start with a very simple peer protocol. It's a full-blown peer, so the client has a particular index i that it wants to get. The server has a database, and what they do is the following. First, they will run an R peer protocol where the client will get from the server just a random index j, not necessarily the index that it wants to get. Then the client sends to the server delta, which is an exclusive O of the index that it wants and the index that it got. You think of all these two are log n bit strings, and you just send in the XOR of the two. The server will partition the set of indexes n into n over two pairs, k and k XOR delta, and notice that one of these pairs will be i comma j, and then for every pair it computes just the XOR of the two database bits in these two indexes, and it sends these two n over two these n over 2 bits to the client. Now the client already know database at point j and now it knows the exclusive O of it with the database at point i, so now it can compute the database bit at position i. Now if the RP takes R rounds and has certain communication C sub C for the client and C sub S for the server, then the simple peer protocol that I just described take R plus two rounds because you first run R peer and then two more rounds. And the communication, there is additional log n bits that the client sends and n over two bits that the server sends. n over two being less than n, this is a non-trivial protocol. But it's not great. n over two is still a lot, so we want to do better. And can we do better? So it turns out that yes. And the observation here is look at the last two steps in this protocol. The last two steps is just a trivial peer protocol for a database of size n over 2. Right? The server sends the n over 2 bits, the client look up one of them. So instead of that, how about we replace this, this trivial peer with a recursive call for the same protocol itself. So that gives us recursive peer. Um, every level what happens is you run a peer protocol on a database of size n over 2 to the i, then the client sends log n minus i bits, which is the delta at that level, and then you make the recursive call all the way down until you get to a database of size 1, and then the server just sends that one bit to the client. Uh, so if the R peer protocol takes R rounds and has communication C sub C and C sub S, then the recursive uh, protocol here takes at most uh, R plus 1 times log n rounds, of communication, and the communication is at most log n times the RP protocol, plus the, the client sends log n choose two bits, and the server sends one more bit. So that's nice. Uh, but there is still a question of the number of rounds. I mean, we multiply the number of rounds by log n, which is not great. 
can we do something better than that? Can we have a, a protocol that has fewer rounds? And it turns out that in some sense we can. Uh, and that's just a generalization of the simple peer protocol. But instead of just a single R peer run, uh, the client and server will now run t minus one of them. So the client will get t minus one indexes, random indexes that the server doesn't know. Then the client will partition this index set instead of into pairs, into t tuples. One of these tuples includes the index i that it wants and all the j sub k's that it got. And all the other sets there are just random. And then for every t-tuple, the server sends the XOR of all these t-bits in the database, and the client, again, knows all the bits at position j sub k, and it knows the XOR of everything, so now it can compute the bit at position i. This is r plus round, two rounds, the server communication is n over 2. The client communication is long because sending a random partition takes many bits. And maybe you can improve it, but we didn't quite find a way to do that. Okay, uh, an obvious open question is to find better reductions, so better tighter reductions from r peer to peer. The next thing that I want to show you is that you can actually use our peer in a setting where peer is not applicable, and that setting is a non-interactive setting. You may have an initial setup phase that, irrespective of both database and um, index of the client, and after that, every time the uh, server wants to convey a random index to the client, it just sends to it a single message. The client never speaks again. Clearly, you cannot do peer this way because the client has no chance of uh, inputting the input uh, index that it wants. So you cannot do R peer. You cannot do peer this way, but you can do R peer. One very simple example is doing it with FHE. Right? So you have a setup phase where the client sends a public key and an encryption of a PRF seed. And then in the online phase, every time the server wants to send a random bit to the client, it just chooses a nonce computed homomorphically uh, i, which is a PRF of the nonce with the seed, and you get an encryption of i, and then continue to compute homomorphically the database at that position and send to the client. So this is a very easy protocol. In the paper, we also have a more complicated non-interactive schemes, which is based on uh, just pseudo-random permutation. And this is essentially the protocol of Kushilevitz and Ostrovsky from 2000, but adapted to be non-interactive. Let me also take a small detour and talk about the multi-server RPR case. And it turns out that in a multi-server, you also can do this non-interactive. And in fact, you can do slightly better in some sense because we have two constructions. One construction is an information theoretic construction where it doesn't even have a setup phase. When just two servers, both of them have uh, the database and every time they want this, the client to get a random index, then each of them send the message to the client, the client gets a random index and they both send less than n bits. So that's nice. Uh, the thing that's not so nice about it is one of them has to send half the bits of the database, and we actually don't know how to do better than that. Then we have another approach, sort of generic, for converting mServer peer to an mServer non-interactive R peer using uh, pseudonym functions. I'll put generic in quotations because really we only have one example where this transformation, we know how to make this transformation work, but it's plausible that there are others. Let's start with the information theoretic construction. This is very similar to the simple peer reduction that I described before. Server one will choose just a random index j and send j and the database at position j to the client. Server two will choose at random delta in zero one to the log n and will partition n into n over two pairs k and kx or delta. So again, in a particular one of these pairs is j, x or, j comma j x or delta. And then it computes for each pair the exclusive O of the two database bits. It sends delta and the n over two bits to the client, and the client recover i as j x or 
delta and recover the database at position i as the bit that it knows XOR sigma for the pair ij. And just, uh, I didn't uh, say it before, but uh, you need to handle the case of delta equals zero, then in that case servers to just send delta, there's no point in partitioning anything there, and the client just output uh, the database position, bit at position j, and you can check that the probability distribution is the one it should be. Um, it would be really nice to be able to extend it in some way and get uh, construction where the server can send less than n over 2 bits. We were not able to find one. You cannot do the recursive things because it's interactive. You cannot do the partition one because describing the partition takes too many bits. So it is an open problem. Moving on to the transformation, let me try to describe how to transform a multi-server private information retrieval into a non-interactive RPA. So look at a typical multi-server peer protocol where it has only two rounds of communication in this case. The client will send to the servers queries that are individually random but correlated, and the servers will, each of them, un uh, have the database, answer its own queries, and the answer back to the client, and the client will reconstruct the bit that it wants, the random bit that it wants, or sort of the bit that it wants. So the question is, is there a way where the servers can generate the random correlated queries themselves without any interaction with the, with the client? And actually we can hope that there is, because there is a lot of work in the recent years about uh, pseudo-random randomness correlate, correlated randomness generation. So maybe some of this technology can be used here. And indeed there is one example where we know where that thing works. And that example uses the Reed Salomon peer protocol that was from the original CGKS paper. In that protocol, the database is encoded by a multivariate polynomial with v variables, degree d, and a polynomial over some zq. And the way it's encoded is that inside of some cube of size d plus 1 to the v, every entry, the evaluation of the polynomial at every entry contains some bits of the database. So the evaluation at every point is an element of ZQ, so it uh, contains log Q, a bit from the database. And this scheme uses D plus one server, and each server is holding the database and therefore knows the polynomial F sub DB. The client has a particular part of the database that it wants to recover. In particular, it wants to, to get the evaluation of f sub db at a particular point a inside of that cube. So it's going to choose a random line in zq to the v that passes via the point that it's interested in. So l sub x is a plus x times b, where a is the point that it wants, b is a random point, and x is a variable that ranges over ZQ. It's a scalar. Uh, it sends to the JF server, the JF point on the, on the line, L sub J, and the server replies with uh, the evaluation of the database polynomial at that point. So YJ is F at C sub J. A note that uh, the y's are just a uh, computed by a polynomial, which is the um, composition of the database polynomial and the linear line polynomial. So the yj's are just the valuation of some degree d polynomial g uh, on x. And since there are d plus 1 server, then the client now knows d plus 1 evaluation point of this degree d polynomial, so it can recover the entire degree d polynomial, and then it finds the point that it's interested is as just g at the evaluated at zero. So this is how the client recovers the point that it's interested in. Converting this to a non-interactive RP, we're going to use a pseudorandom secret sharing techniques. This is a technique that date back to Gilboa Ishai and then uh, Kramer Damgard Ishai later on. I'm not going to tell you how those works ex exactly, but the, th the main thing is uh, you in a pre-computation, in, pre in a setup phase, you will distribute PRF seeds among the servers, and different subsets of server will get different PRF seeds. And then the servers can generate pseudo-random degree T Shamir sharing locally without any interaction. Every server just uses the 
PRF seats that uh, they know. So the first Shamir sharing, they all uh, evaluate the PRF seed, the PRFs at one. The second one, they all evaluate it at two, etc. So they can generate then unlimited number of uh, pseudo-random seeds without talking to each other at all. So, sorry, Shamir sharing without talking to each other at all. Uh, here we're going to use PRSS for random lines, so this is degree one polynomials, and the servers just generate the query, the thing that they would have received from the uh, client by themselves, right? They just uh, compute CJ equals LJ for a random line L that they generate themselves using their pseudorandom seeds, and then the lines are therefore pseudorandom lines. Uh, now there is a point here that the, what the client needs to get eventually is the evaluation of f on a random point, but a random point inside of the cube. It's not guaranteed that the line, which is just a random line, will intersect that cube. If it does, then the client learns a random database entry. It just chooses maybe a random, if it intersects in more than one point, it chooses a, a random one of them. Uh, but uh, if the line doesn't intersect the cube, then we're stuck. So you actually, the servers actually need to send multiple lines uh, so that we get that with high probability at least one of them will intersect the cube. What kind of parameters do you get? So you have a database of size n, you need to find the parameters d, q, and v, and the constraints are, first of all, you need to be able to encode the entire database. So if you look at all the evaluation inside of the cube, there are d plus 1 to the v of them. Each one of them can hold log q bits. So the total number of bits that you can encode this way has to be at least n. q has to be bigger than d plus 1 because you need to interpolate a degree d polynomial. And the last thing is that d plus 1 to the power v, the size of this cube, has to be a large enough fraction of the entire space so that random lines will intersect the cube with noticeable probability. And in fact, you can see that uh, the number of lines that the servers need to send is something like q over d to the power v in order to get uh, intersection with high probability. Uh, and for each line, we have uh, communication which is essentially d points, d plus one point, or two d plus one point, whatever, uh, so roughly d log q bits. So the total communication of this protocol is d log q times q over d to the power v. Now we can set the parameters to get various trade-offs. So we will always set, set q equals d plus two because it's the smallest possible. And now if you want the minimum amount of communication, you will set both d and v to be uh, log n, and then you get a polylog communication. And if you add the constant number of servers, then uh, you get n to the epsilon communication. The more servers, the less communication, obviously. An obvious open problem here is find other instances where this transformation works. I mean, this one was very, very simple using PRSS. Maybe there are other ways to get the correlation that you need for peer protocols. Okay, the next thing that I want to tell you a little bit is how to, uh, just one slide of how to apply the ideas that we had so far for to peer with pre-processing. And here we notice that the simple peer and partition peer protocols that I described below have the following structure where first the client and server run some R peer protocol on the original database and the client learns some bits. Then once the client knows what index it's interested in, uh, then it sends a single message to the server, and then the client and the server will run a peer protocol on the smaller database of size n over 2, or n over t if it's the partition one. That means that step one you can do during pre-processing. So step two and three are done online, but the work here is reduced by a factor of 2 or a factor of t. So this is a very, very light weight of doing pre-processing. Okay, and with that, I told you all I wanted to tell you about RPR as a primitive, so let's spend a few minutes talking about application of RPR to the secret on the blockchain architecture. And in this context, when I say blockchain, what I really mean is a system with many nodes. Most of them are assumed honest. There is nothing blockchain-y about it. Um, the motivation slides that I'm going to go through now are courtesy of uh, Sophia. 
So think of a secure MPC as a service. We have clients, they want to compute some function and they want to send it to the cloud that uh, will compute it for them. But for privacy reasons, for um, resilience reasons, you want the cloud to be implemented as a secure MPC so that it will give you both guarantee that you get the correct output with guaranteed output delivery and privacy. Now, of course, that only happens as long as some less than some T of the servers that make up this cloud are corrupt. So that's nice. I mean, you get uh, additional benefits um, to the clients. But now think of doing the same thing with millions of parties. So you have a blockchain and you want the blockchain to compute that thing for you. So the entire system consists of God only knows how many uh, nodes now need to compute. And you can do the exact same thing, right? I mean, they could, in principle, run a secure MPC protocol and give you correct output and privacy as long as not too many are corrupted. But there is an efficiency issue here, right? A run-of-the-mill MPC protocol typically have every server, every node talk to every other node and that's very very expensive when there are many nodes so in addition to security goals that we had from before now we have an efficiency goal and the goal that we want to uh, focus here is sublinear communication in the number of parties we do not want every party to talk to every other party no. an obvious way to try to do that is uh, use a small committee. So choose a random committee to represent the entire thing. If a majority of parties in the overall population are honest, then hopefully with some high probability, the majority of parties also in the committee will be uh, honest, and then you can just run a regular secure MPC protocol here. The problem with that is what happens if the adversary is adaptive? As soon as these nodes start talking, the adversary know who the committee is, and then it just goes and corrupt them. Or maybe not corrupt them, maybe the other side is not all that powerful, but it can at least DDoS them. It just knocks them off and your entire computation, all the state that you built so far, is dead. So what do we do? One thing that we'll do is we'll switch to a Yoso style secure computation protocol. This is a style of protocol that was studies, uh, in crypt, studied in crypto this uh, year by Gentry et al. And the type of protocol that we're talking about, we have evolving committee, each active for just one step. As soon as you say something, your role is over. So after the first step, the adversary corrupt maybe the first committee, but now there's a whole new committee that needs to talk. And after the adversary maybe corrupt them, there's a new committee. Every time, by the time that the adversary learns who the committee is, uh, this committee is no longer active and, and there's nothing to be gained by killing it, DDoSing it, or, or, or corrupting it. So this is the style of protocols that uh, we would like to use here. And uh, Gentry et al. showed that essentially every uh, function you can compute in this style of protocols even if you want things like guaranteed app delivery, etc., as long as uh, you have an honest majority among the entire population. But there is a problem, and the problem is how to forward state between committees. So in this setting, we want the committees to be hidden from the adversary so that they will not be corrupted or DDoSed. But then if nobody knows who the committee is, how do you send them the messages that they need to see in order to participate in the computation. And this thing was actually considered by uh, Ben Hamoud et al. And they talked about the notion of uh, target anonymous channels to send messages. So everybody would be able to send message to party I in the next committee without knowing who that party is. Uh, how to implement those was left explicitly out of scope. Uh, in the Yoso paper of Gentry et al., but it was addressed by Ben Hamoud et al., and they gave some solution. I'll talk about it a bit in the next slide, uh, but that solution is a little defective. I mean, it can only withstand corruptions of up to about roughly a quarter of the overall population, uh, and not more than that. So the goal here is to construct target anonymous channels. So first of all, we're going to assume PKI and authenticated broadcast. The reason I don't have a problem assuming that is we're thinking of blockchains and blockchain give you that sort of for free. As long as the blockchain works, you have that. Uh, and if you have PKI and authenticated broadcast, then really all you need is some way to re-randomize the public keys of parties. So if by some chance, a re-randomized version of my public key appears on the, on the broadcast channel, 
then everybody can send me um, now messages and they don't need to know who I am. All they need to know is, well, this is the public key of party number five in the next committee, let's encrypt to it. And I know that this is my uh, public key and I can decrypt it. So it sort of boils down to the question is, how do you choose and re-randomize the key without the adversary learning who that key belongs to? And Ben Hamoud et al. actually did offer a solution. In their case, there was another auxiliary committee that chose the committee that is going to get the, uh, going to participate in the computation. Uh, and then each member of this auxiliary committee chose one member of the secret sharing committee and re-randomized its key. But that has a problem of a double dipping attack because now the adversary knows who is in the committee if either that person itself was uh, corrupted or the person that nominated them to the committee was corrupted. So there is a double dipping, which is why we cannot get better than resilience against a quarter of corruptions by the adversary. Uh, the idea that we want to explore here is we already have committees. They are already running secure MPC protocol. How about these previous committees will also do the work that's needed in order to uh, uh, establish the target anonymous channel? We will bootstrap these things off of the previous committees. And that works. So think of the uh, target anonymous channel function. It takes n public keys. This is a public key input and it takes randomness. This is a private input for the n parties or for the k parties, whatever, and it outputs k re-randomized keys out. And that works. I mean, this, from security point of view, this is exactly what you want, but it does have a problem uh, in that it's not scalable. Our point was to use less than n bits of communications here, and this definitely doesn't do that. I mean, if you think of the circuit that computes that function, that circuit has long input, in particular the n public keys. So if you want to just apply a uh, run-of-the-mill MPC protocols, uh, you'll get at least n bits of communication. So we want to do better, and we're going to, here is where we're going to use our peer. How do we use our peer? We can break the computation of the target anonymous channel function into first do batch our peer to fetch k random public keys from the PKI, and then re-randomize these k random keys. Now, for the batch RPR, the previous committees will just simulate the RPR client, and since the database is public, then each member can individually play the server in its head. The communication here is a little off end because RPR is not trivial, but notice that this is a really weird use of, R, of peer or RPR, because you don't need to broadcast the thing that the server says. Everybody plays the server in their head and they can imagine uh, what the server would say without needing to, to broadcast it. The thing that you really care about is to have a very short communication for the client. So it is a weird use of peer. Uh, the other thing to notice is that uh, since we have a committee that implements the secure computation, the output of it, that is the K public keys, are uh, shared among this committee at the end of this step, so the adversary still doesn't know them. And then you run the re-randomized part. This is a function that doesn't depend on n, so it's scalable. And then you reconstruct the re-randomized public keys and broadcast them to the broadcast channel, and this is how you establish the target anonymous channel. So if this is what we want to do, what do we need from the RPR protocol? So we need it to be very efficient, small communication, simple processing, and because we're simulating the client with a secure computation, and a also secure computation at that, these are typically heavier MPC, then it better be the case that what the client computes in this RPR protocol is very, very, very simple. Um, and from security, we want to make sure that the adversary doesn't learn who's on the next committee, which means that uh, the next committee should be at least unpredictable in, a, in, a, in the sense that the adversary cannot guess more than half of the members of it to corrupt. Uh, so we can use the batch RPR with weaker security because all we want here is unpredictability and not super randomness, and that helps a lot. Let me just show you one very, very simple thing that we can do just because we can uh, use the uh, unpredictability version of this instead of the pseudo-randomness. So instead of choosing at random k entries from the entire database, we just partition the database into m bins, m is some parameter, 
and we choose at random k over m for each bin. So now, um, you know, clearly there are many subsets that cannot be chosen this way because many subsets don't have exactly k over m from each bin, many k subsets, but you can see that um, at least it saves an m factor in server work because uh, now you fetch the same number of points, you, save, you fetch k points, but you fetch them from databases of size k over m instead of uh, size n over m instead of databases of size n. Uh, so definitely you save at least a factor of n in the server work and whether or not to how much you send in client work depends really on, on what peer protocol you're using underlying it. And in terms of uh, probability, so it, yeah, as I said, many subsets can no longer appear, but the subsets that can appear are distributed uniformly. And in fact, the fraction of subsets that can appear is not too tiny. It's a fraction that's exponentially in M and polynomially in N, small. So if you set M to be log, then you, know, the, you still have a polynomial fraction of the uh, subsets that can appear and uh, therefore the probability mass of each one of them grows by at most a polynomial factor and therefore you have this definition that anything that was uh, any bad event that happened with neg negligible probability when you just use the completely random peer will still happen with negligible probability even in this case. So that's all I wanted to tell you today. Uh, we introduced the random peer, it's a weaker variant of peer it can be somewhat more efficient than peer, uh, but not too much because they're equivalent as primitives. Still, there are gains to be had, and it's motivated by our application to very large scale MPC, which we call secrets on the blockchain, and it allows us in particular to construct target anonymous channels, which are resilient to compromise of up to half minus epsilon of the party, as opposed to the solution uh, of the Hamoud et al that can only tolerate about a quarter of the party's corrupted. And that's uh, all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much.